Good morning, folks. And, um, oh, whoopee, that's lovely. Today, Sunday, the 22nd of May, 2022, we have another sharing on the But God series, uh, the surprise of full provision. And we've been singing in our last hymn very much about the hand of God that provides, um, and we shall be learning a little bit more about it. But first of all, let's pray. Father, we give you thanks and praise you for you are good and your love endures forever. This we believe. Please forgive our unbelief. Amen. Now, our thinking today is centered around Psalm 73 and verse 26. And uh, I'd like us to note, we're having a little bit of an introduction and a run-up to verse 26. Uh, we're going to cherry-pick our way through the part of the psalm. So let's note something about it. It's a psalm of Asaph. But first of all, what do we know about Asaph? You, you can put your suggestions forward if you like. Um, I did look up a little bit and... Uh, Asaph has about 13 psalms, I think, attributed to his name. 11 in the group here in the 70s, one in the early part of the psalms and one later on. But apart from that collection of psalms attributed to him, uh, he was part of a trio of worship leaders organized by David to supervise the music on the great day when the Ark of God was brought to its final home in God's city. And we learn about that in 1 Chronicles chapters 15 and 16. David appointed three men from the clans of Levi, and they were named Heman, or Heman, I think that's the way it's probably pronounced, and Ethan. And they were assigned to the area of praise and worship at Gibeon. And then there was Asaph, in Jerusalem. In a way, it was rather like having Matt Redmond, Stuart Townend, and Graham Kendrick being commissioned to write stuff for a Christian celebration. Or, as an alternative, for those of us who are a bit older, maybe it could have been Charles Wesley, Francis Ridley Havergal, and Ira Sankey. But down to business. In Psalm 73, Asaph is having a problem. One that all of us have had, I'm sure, from time to time. Verse 1 of this psalm is very much a very short Jewish creed. Surely God is good to Israel. And if you were, had your Bible open, you'd notice there's not a question mark at the end of that. It's a statement. Because the word for surely, I think, if I got it rightly, is the word ak, ak. And it means truly, really, of a truth. This is right. Surely God is, is, uh, is good to, uh, to Israel. And he, yes, we know, he really is. This is what we believe. And this is what we've discovered from time to time in our lives. But this defines what the Israelites believed. The difficulty is what Asaph sees in the world around, which seems to contradict what is said in the temple or the synagogue. Or in our case, what is declared in church. And our, we have that question. Asaph asks the questions. Is God really being good? I look around me and I see all the things that are going on. And I think at times we arrive at the same conclusion. Is God always good to his people? You see, Asaph sees the wicked prosper. And those who seem totally uninterested in God, yet they are healthy, strong, and carefree. Yeah, we'll get there. Those who are arrogant and malicious, and they get away with it. Better catch up with myself here. Got so many little clicks. I love this. I think it's smashing. <coughs> and why are they allowed to lead so many astray? 
verses 10 and 11. So Asaph doubts and questions. I wonder if we ask ourselves honestly, do we understand how he feels? Now, it's not that he's slipping into unbelief. For doubt is something that only believers can experience. And I want to repeat that because I thought it was worth noting. Doubt is something only believers can experience. You can only doubt what you believe. One one commentator and communicator says that doubt is to unbelief what temptation is to sin. It's a test but it's not yet a surrender. So we see Asaph's crisis in verses 13 to 17. It's this. What's the point of trying to do right when those who do wrong get on okay? You ever felt like that? Now, is Asaph or Asaph as we Uh, or we were to express our feelings publicly, we, like he, would possibly think we were going to let down our fellowship or the Christian faith and weaken what's going on in our lives and the lives of others. But that thought actually leads him to something else. It leads him to the sanctuary of God, where his questions will be answered, as will ours. In God's presence, the facts come into clear focus. Even in his deepest distress, he is surrounded by the grace of God. And so are we. Wow. (laughs) At last, folks, we get to... Oh, I didn't want that one. Go back. At last, verse 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but... God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. A real indication of full provision. God is our provider. And I want us to think here of Abraham and Isaac. You know the story. In Genesis 22 verse 8. He goes up the mountain with Isaac and... uh, Isaac queries, where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb? God will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. There was trust between father and son. There was trust between father and God. And we know that Abraham, uh, because of the way God provided the sacrifice, named the place Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord who provides. With the focus not only on the provision, but on the provider. Abraham was focused on the provider. Think of Moses on Mount Sinai, Exodus 33, 18 and 19. And I'd like to paraphrase. Moses says to God, please show me your glory. What God says is, I will make all my goodness Pass before you. I will make all my goodness pass before you. Now, folks, this really is big. For God's goodness is a vitally important thing about him. For from that goodness flows his compassion and grace and provision. And then we need to think of Jesus. The king of an upside-down kingdom to which you and I belong. He turned the thinking of his generation upside down in many ways. He drove his hearers from the letter of the law to the spirit of the law. He drove people to examine their motives. He was more concerned with why they did or did not do things Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Luke 6, 46. And why do you call me good? 
No one is good except God alone. And we've sung on our second hymn that God is good. And he runs after us. It's only God who is fully good. And it's only God who really runs after us. Asaph's motives were quite confused. So God had to lead him to the place where he could recognize, firstly, who God is. Secondly, that God is good. Thirdly, that he loves and forgives. Then, that his love endures forever. After that, that God provides and that it is within himself, that is within God, that Asaph and we discover this. Maybe we could think of St. Paul as he writes to the Philippian Christians. Now he's under house arrest in Rome. He has been beaten, imprisoned, stoned, and a lot more. Yet he can write, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and of suffering need. I can do all things through him, who strengthens me. Sorry, I got behind myself. Philippians 4, 11 and 13. See, Asaph and Paul both learned that God is enough. Surprisingly, he will fully provide. Short story. Small boy came home from church, having learned about Psalm 23. So dad asked, so what did you learn about Psalm 23? The answer is quite priceless. The lad said, the Lord is my shepherd. That's all I want. Abraham learned it. Moses learned it. Paul learned it. Asaph learned it. Jesus taught it. The surprise of full provision. Loving Lord, forgive me for my all too frequent tendency to look at what others have rather than all that I have in you. Teach me the lessons of contentment that find my deepest satisfaction in who you are, not in what I have. Thank you for loving me, and please show me the enoughness of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>